Welcome back. It's such a nice warm day and um, I know it's uh, the kind where you like to get in a hammock under a tree or something, but uh, we certainly are glad to see you back to worship with us this evening. Let's sing together Save Save 469. Shall we stand please? Together. I found a friend who is all to me. His love Welcome back to North Baptist Church. Hopefully you all had a great, great day uh, here this morning in the house of the Lord and had a great day of rest. And I trust that you're ready for uh, another evening in God's word, followed by um, some good time of fellowship and food with one another. So it's great to see you all this evening. Let's open up the service in a word of prayer. Father, again, we come to you thankful for another Lord's Day, another day that we can rest and take time about out of our week to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and to worship you, to sing to you, to fellowship. And Lord, just uh, we thank you for the fellowship we can have with each other, and it's only through you that we can have that. And we thank you for it. Lord, I just ask that you'd be with us this evening as we go into your word. Lord, that our hearts and minds would be attentive and that we would be able to glean something from your word this evening and that we would be changed by it. And Lord, that our relationship with you would grow because of it. Lord, I just pray that you would be with us during our time of fellowship this evening, Lord, that we would 
be able to lift each other up and edify one another. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. And we're going to sing some lively Jewish music even as we sit there. So don't fall asleep as we're doing that. Jehovah Jireh, which is 124, followed by He is Jehovah, 118. All right, let's sing together, shall we? Jehovah Jireh, my provider, His grace is sufficient for me. For me, for me, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. He gives his angels charge over me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. Now, wait a minute. That, that, that wasn't up to speed. Do we want to try it again seated or do we need to stand to do this? Let's take a vote. How many of you think we need to stand? Okay, well, let's see a little more life. You can stay seated. All right, here we go. One more time. Jehovah Jireh. Shall we please? Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. He gives his angels charge over me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. That's pretty good. Shall we? He is Jehovah. He is Jehovah, God of creation. He is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty, the balm of Gilead, the rock of ages. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. Singing hallelujah, he is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. On verse 2, he is the great I am, the God of Abraham. Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace I am, the God of Israel, the everlasting one. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. He is Jehovah. Lord God Almighty, He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. On verse 3, He's your provider, Jehovah Jireh, God of salvation, God of Messiah, the Son He sent to you. He testified of him. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. He is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. Pretty good singing, I must admit. Thank you so much. What do we have going now? A little offertory? I think we're doing announcements. And well, you're gonna, oh, you're going to get announcements first. That's good to know. So. Thank you. Would you introduce Tim and Linda afterwards? I will do All that. All right, thank you. <laughs>
All right, we're going to get our act together one of these days. So, uh, Before Jack comes and reads a missionary letter, I'll just uh, give some reminders of uh, what's going on this week. First of all, again, as you can see, as you walked in, VBS, um, we have almost all the decorations up. We have a little bit left to do on the stage here, but it's almost all done, so um, there's been a lot of planning and decorating going into that. So we're looking forward to that starting tomorrow. Uh, that's at 6 o'clock to 8.30. And again, the ages are from 2 years old to 12 years old. So if you know anyone that has kids that uh, they would like to get rid of them for a couple hours every, uh, every day this week, we'd love to have them. Um, also Tuesday, men's prayer meeting at 8.30, ladies' prayer time at 10. There's also a deacon's meeting on Tuesday. Again, just a reminder, um, if you show up for church on Wednesday, we'll throw you into VBS. So um, please come. We'd love to have you here. You can see what the kids are learning and uh, have an enjoyable time yourself. So there will be no um, corporate time of worship for the adult Bible study. Um, but if you would like to come, we'd love to have you as part of our VBS. And then um, this Saturday, Anna Garian's open house um, is, is this Saturday. So if you'd like to come out and celebrate with her, the information for that is back on the bulletin. And then looking to next Sunday, we will not be having, having an evening service um, in lieu of Father's Day. Um, so spend some time with, uh, with your fathers or remembering fathers that have passed on next Sunday after the morning service. And uh, that will also be the time when the uh, baby bottles are due for Flint Crisis Pregnancy Services. So um, lots of stuff coming up this week. Uh, as long as we stay busy, then uh, we're, we're doing something right. So uh, uh, we're, uh, we're looking forward to all the fun stuff we have planned. So at this time, if, I'll, if uh, Jack will come up. Feels hot outside and kind of wintry in here. Looks like you're going to have a great time at Vacation Bible School. You pray for, uh, for that time. This is from the Lowry's, who are missionaries to Thailand, and this is what they have to say. Dear friends, since our last letter, we've passed our three-year mission anniversary of arriving in Thailand. We praise God for sustaining and directing us throughout our time here. Our time in Thailand has been marked with a variety of experiences that we believe God is using to prepare us for the work ahead. While learning the language, we worked in two existing churches with the Thai Christians and missionaries and have been involved in several kinds of ministries. This has all been good training and practical experience in showing love, giving the gospel, and discipling believers. Our goal in coming was to do these things in order to plant churches. We're starting to get anxious to get to that part of our ministry now that we are more prepared and experienced. We are considering a furlough next year to report to our supporters and plan to spend the remainder of this year doing the ministries that we are already involved in while preparing to begin the work of a church plant when we get back from furlough. I, Brian, just took a trip to the U.S. to be in a wedding and visit a few people. It was fun and encouraging, but it was also nice to be back. The good news is that some and the kids survived without me. The better news is I didn't forget the Thai language. Next week, we're all going to a camp for, for missionary kids in Southeast Asia. This will be a blessing to us and an opportunity to invest in others. Our kids are excited to see their friends. So we thank God for that too. Please pray that this is a great week for our kids spiritually and socially. Thanks for your prayers and support. We love you all and are grateful for you. Here's some uh, prayer requests that they've asked us to pray about. Please pray that we stay focused while we press on towards the goals. Pray that we don't grow weary of doing good. Pray that the words may be given to us to proclaim the gospel. And pray that people's hearts will be open to pay attention to the gospel. Some prayer requests that we have. Um, now, next year, as they come here on furlough, we're going to try and get them to uh, be here and report uh, uh, on our ministry uh, to us. So you pray about that. Men, if you want to come forward. Appreciate your prayers for Gloria and I will be <coughs> traveling down to North Carolina this coming Friday to visit with our son for about a week. So appreciate your prayers on our behalf. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessings from your word this morning. Pray that you'll be with Pastor Andrew tonight as he speaks, Father. Soften our hearts and open our ears. I pray for the Lowry's Father that uh, as they are anxious to begin planting churches in Thailand, I pray that that will happen. And as they uh, uh, continue to work there, and uh, as the plans to come home uh, next year on furlough, pray that uh, they'll be able to uh, uh, have a ministry here at North. I pray, Father, now that uh, you would just uh, meet the prayer requests that they had, Father. Pray that you'll use them in a special way. Be with all our missionaries, Father. Pray that you'll protect them and give them good health. 
and meet your needs in a special way. Pray now that you'll take this offering, Father. I pray that it'll be used to bring honor and glory to your name. For it's your name we pray. Amen. Tim and Linda. We appreciate the music for the offertory. Sometimes we forget to uh, mention that um, there are a number of folks around the church who, if they were pulled out of the church, there would all of a sudden be a whole, you know, wall on the side that would be collapsing because they've got so many responsibilities and the Dubovskis fit into that category. So when you get an opportunity to thank them for all they do, they, amongst many, pull a lot of different, or wear a lot of different hats. So we thank you for that. Let's sing together, shall we? Hymn number 146, Praise You, followed by Wonderful Grace of Jesus, 163. Praise You. Let's stand together, please. Praise You. of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea.
the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn in sunder, giving me liberty for the wonderful grace of Jesus. Reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled. By its transforming power, making him God's dear child. Purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity. And the wonderful grace of Jesus. Reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgressions. Greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. It's great singing. Thank you so much. Please be seated. And at this time, Florence Bauer is going to come and sing for us. Florence, if you would, please. Philippians 4:14. 4, I press toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah. 
Turn to your Bibles this evening to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. As has been said multiple times, tomorrow we start vacation Bible school. And I've mentioned it a few times that the theme of vacation Bible school is the importance of the Bible. Uh, and every day there's five letters in the Bible and there's five uh, days and hour week that we are going to be looking at. So they take a letter out of each, or they take a word out of each letter uh, in the word Bible. So it's the book of books. That'll be tomorrow. The book of books. Then on Tuesday, it has an incredible impact. On Wednesday, it's the bedrock base of our lives. Thursday, it's a letter of love. And then Friday, it's exciting to explore. And that's going to be the theme of our week. And as I was looking at this VBS, and I've been looking over the different aspects of VBS and, and this curriculum and what we're going through, I sometimes wonder if we can say in our lives that it's the book of books. It has an incredible impact in our lives. It's the bedrock base for which we live our lives. It's a letter of love for us, and it is exciting to explore. And sometimes we can say, yes, that's, that's true, but how often is that really true? And as the kids are going to come in tomorrow, there's going to be a need for the adults that are working VBS to be excited for them. Because if we aren't excited about Vacation Bible School, the kids are not going to be excited about Vacation Bible School. And if we are not excited about the Bible being the book of books, about it being a letter of love, about it being the bedrock base for our life, and about it being exciting to explore, the kids are not going to be thinking the same thing. And too often in our churches today, the Bible is not exciting to explore. The Bible is not our bedrock base. It's not the book of books. So tonight we're going to look at the power of of God's word in Nehemiah, but first we're going to read from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Let's pray. Father, again, we come to you looking for help as we go into your word, looking for discernment, looking for guidance, and Lord, I just pray that you would block out any distractions that we could have this evening and that you would just uh, allow your word to penetrate our hearts and our minds. I pray that you would just allow us to find that your word is the bedrock base, that it's the book of books, it's our letter of love, and it's exciting to explore. And I pray that that would be true in our lives. In your name we ask these things. Amen. So... Tonight, if you want to go ahead and turn to Nehemiah chapter 8, that's where we are, we are going to spend most of our time this evening. Nehemiah chapter 8. And we're going to look at the power of God's Word. In every revival among God's people, the Word of the Lord has been the central piece of revival. The two things that... that 
that mark a great awakening or a great revival in God's church is reading of the Word, prayer, and applying that reading of the Word. It has a large piece in the revival. It, that was, it was so in Josiah's day. It was so in Hezekiah's day. It's been the same throughout, the, the, through all, throughout all the church period. Studying of the Bible has been the focus of revival in the world. In the 16th century, it was true. And in the 19th century, it was true in all the Great Awakenings. But it wasn't just Bible study that brought great awakening. It was Bible practice. All throughout history, men have studied and devoted their lives to dissecting the Word of God, but not many men have devoted their lives to practicing the Word of God. And when the studying gets put into practice, revival happens. In the Great Awakening in the 19th century that swept through Ireland and Great Britain, it happened just about the same time. Great Britain and Ireland had these great awakenings, these great revivals. And what you see happening, if you study into those revivals, you see small groups of people getting together to look and see what the Word has to say about how to live. And they, they aren't just going there as a means to get some mental knowledge to say they're a little bit smarter than everyone else. They're going there because they're in a state of confusion. They're in a time where um, laws and and different rules that they have to abide by don't really go with what the Word of God says. So you see these small groups of people getting together and they're studying the Word and they're, they're taking what the government and what the religious leaders are saying to them. And they're seeing what the Word, what God's Word says to them and they're putting them against each other and where the rules and regulation of the government doesn't fit the teaching of the, Bibles, they, of the Bible, they throw it out. And with that, the awakening comes. One commentator put it this way, they, they disowned everything for which they could, couldn't find either a plain, thus saith the Lord, nor a divine principle exemplified in the Scripture. They turned away from all sects and systems to be known as brethren in Christ, members of His body, seeking to walk in subjection to the Holy Spirit. Through this study, they, they realize that Jesus Christ is the center of their gathering. The church is one body in which the Holy Spirit dwells and guides through His Word. And that's what they find. And, and what's interesting is the same source of truth that was there for Josiah and was there for Hezekiah and was there for the 16th century Christians and the 19th century Christians, the same Word is here for us today. And it hasn't changed. It's been the same word from that day to this day. It's been the same. But the result has also been the same. The same source of truth and information which sparked such a great awakening many, many times is the same source that we have in our hands every Sunday that we bring our Bibles to church. And, and that should excite us. That, that should give us a, a sense of purpose that the, word, the same Word of God, the same book that 16th century, 19th century Christians used and awakening swept the area and the people that they lived around, the same Word we have today. We have the same one. I, I, I don't like to travel because I don't like riding in cars for very long. But I, uh, I've, got, I've gotten to go to Gettysburg a couple of times. And if any of you have been to Gettysburg, um, it's one of those places you could visit every weekend and never get tired of it. Um, but one of, the, one of the greatest things I like about visiting those type of landmarks is you go to that landmark and you stand there and you think, wow, I stood where somebody else stood. I'm, I'm touching a stone they might have touched. I'm, I'm walking on dirt they might have walked on. And with that same sense of awe, we can come to the Word of God and say, wow, I'm holding the same Word of God that Billy Graham preached from and thousands came to know the Lord. It's the same Word of God that missionaries have taken to tribes that people have never even heard of and shared the gospel with them. It's the same Word. And it's powerful. But too often we, we get away from the Word. 
We get away from the Word and we trade what the Word says with what man's opinion says. And whenever we go with man, man's opinions and what he thinks, and we go with great logic instead of what the Bible says, the house of the Lord becomes more like a social club instead of a place of worship, and the light on the hill gets a little bit more dim. So in Nehemiah, we're going to see a group of believers, and we're going to see their response to the power of the Word of God. And during this time in history, the Jews had rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, and they had established the community of Jerusalem, and everything was almost back to normal except for one thing, and that was they hadn't completely gotten the society turned back to worshiping God, and, and they haven't completely submitted to God yet. It was the month of Tishri during this time, which is the seventh month, and it's the most sacred month of the Jewish year. During this month, they had three celebrations. The first one was the Feast of Trumpets, the second one was the Day of Atonement, and the third one was the Feast of Tabernacle, or the Feast of Booths. And all these can be found in Numbers 29 if you want to go look into them later. But the Feast of Trumpets followed the time of harvest. It was a time of memorial and they would blow trumpets and have formal assemblies as a time of remembering. The Day of Atonement was a time that they would reflect on their shortcomings in life. And then the Feast of Tabernacle was for the time that they spent wandering in the wilderness. They would take a time and they would eat and they would remember their wilderness wandering. And according to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 2, it says the people gathered on the first day of the seventh month in the later part of the verse. It says upon the first day of the seventh month. And so during this time, the Jewish celebrations are, are happening. And throughout the study of Nehemiah 8, you can see that it would be about the time of the Feast of Tabernacle or the Feast of Booths. And this would, this would be the mark of the Jewish um, civil new year. So it's a civil new year. The walls of Jerusalem are being rebuilt. The society is back together. And here, the, the, here these group, this group of people are gathering to read from the Bible. And tonight we're going to see seven things in Nehemiah 8, and I know that whenever you hear seven points are going to be made, you think, wow, I'm not going to eat those sandwiches for a long time. Uh, we're going to get, th we'll get through them fairly quickly. So seven things we're going to find in Nehemiah chapter 8. But first, one other thing that we need to realize is they were commanded to meet publicly like this every seven years. To meet publicly as a group of believers, to hear the Word of God spoken to them and explained to them every seven years. And during this time, um, the Bible wouldn't be in a book as we see it. It would have been in scrolls. It might have been in multiple scrolls at this time. And they call upon Ezra to come and read it. And it was, it's very possible that Ezra might possibly be the only person that has a copy of the Bible in the entire area. And every seven years, they're supposed to publicly come together and hear the reading and the explaining of the written word of God, and they haven't done this since the Babylonian ca captivity, which, if you do the math, would have been about 200 years. So it's been 200 years since they've met like this. They finally rebuilt the city, and now it's time to finally meet. And the first thing we're going to see in verse 1, it says, And all the people... Excuse me. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. First thing we're going to see is they gathered as one man. They were unified. They came together as one unified body of believers, the church of God. And they came together at the water gate. The Bible says they came as one man, as one person. And just as one person would have one mind, one brain, one focus, that's how they met together. And so oftentimes we come to church and we, we all have our different thoughts and we all have our different viewpoints and you interpret this life in this way and I, I believe that you should do it this way. And the reason that they were able to come to this point as one man would was because they weren't coming there looking for 
Mr. A's opinion or Mrs. B's opinion. They came looking for the Bible's opinion. And it allowed them to be as one man. What a fitting name for where they met. It says they met or the street that was before the water gate. There was, there was 10 or 11 gates around the city of Jerusalem. 10 or 11 gates, and, and um, earlier in Nehemiah, you can see through um, all the different gates that were there, but they met at the water gate. And this is an inter interesting place because this is where the servants would go to get water. They would go to get water for cleansing, for cleaning. And this is where the people are meeting to get the living water from the Word of God. And although the name gets its name from having a fresh water spring near it, I just think it, it's probably no coincidence that they met at the water gate. Verse 1, we're going to look at, the, at part 2 of it. First, we see that they came as one man. Secondly, we're going to see why they came. It says, And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded to Israel. So the second thing, they commanded, bring the book. This wasn't so they could worship the book. Uh, one commentator put, I, I think he made up a word, but I, but I kind of like it. He said, this was not bibliolatry. They weren't there to, to worship a piece of paper. They weren't there to worship a scroll. They were there to worship the author of the scroll and the author of the book. It's, it wasn't an acknowledgement of a piece of paper. It was an acknowledgement that the author of this book was trustworthy. He was all-knowing and all-sufficient. And because the author of this book is all-knowing, all-sufficient, the contents in it are the same. And during a confusing time where, where they could have had many different opinions of man, Many opinions that sounded good. Many things that sounded like a logical answer. They wanted to ask, is this biblical? They wanted to know, is this in the Bible? Bring us the book. Bring the book. And if you look all throughout history, the, the, the overriding theme of revivals of, of churches growing is the same call. Bring the book. We want to know what it says. It's what freed the people in Rome. The same response whenever the people, what the people were in Rome was bring the book. Notice they didn't get together and ask for Ezra's opinion. They didn't get together and ask for Nehemiah's opinion. They didn't care what Zerubbabel had to say. They didn't care about any of that. They did not care about man's opinions. All they cared about was what did the book say? What does the book say? Oftentimes when I prepare a message, and I'm sure when Pastor Ben prepares a message and pastors and preachers all around the world, when we study, we, we go to the book first, but we also want to see what other scholars say about it to get some information. And what's happening, what we see happening all around the world today is people are going and they're, they're not going to the book first. They're going to see what so-and-so said about the book. What did he quote about the book? What did she say about the book? But these people didn't come together unified looking for man's opinion. They came unified looking for what was written in God's book. Secondly, the people honored and celebrated the book. If you look at verse 3 and 4, it says, And he read therein before the street, that is Ezra, he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Matthiah, and Shema, and Ananiah, and Urijah, and Hilkiah, and Messiah, and his right hand, and on his left, excuse me, and on his left hand, Padiah, and Mishael, and Malchiah, and Hashem, and Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshaliam. And I probably butchered 90% of those words. But they were there to honor and celebrate the Word of God. This was, 
such a great occasion that they built a platform for Ezra. Some scholars and some others that have studied this book say that, that possibly 30 to 40,000 men could have been there, let alone women and children. And so it was such a great occasion that they built a wooden platform for Ezra to stand on so all the people could see him. And the platform would have been big enough for 14 people to stand up there with him. It was a great occasion. It wasn't just something that, yeah, I might show up. Maybe I'll go and listen to the book being read and explained to us. No, it was a, there was a want, there was a desire to be unified and to see what the book had to say. They celebrated this ability to come listen to it. If you look at, or pick, let's just pick up in verse 5, it says, And Ezra opened the book, and in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. They honored the Word of God. They stood up. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that they, stood back, that they sat back down. It's quite possible that these people, first of all, they might not have had anywhere to sit, but if the, if the Bible says that they stood up, they must have been sitting. So I, 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 to me, I just picture Ezra stepping onto this platform with 14 people around him, and he opens the book, and as he opens it, he has a sea of 30,000 to 50,000 people sitting down, and the second they see the Word of God opened up, they stand up out of reverence to what is about to be read to them. They honored it and they celebrated it. Then in verse 6 it says, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Number four, they subjected themselves to the word. They stood so they honored it, but they also subjected themselves to it. It says they bowed their heads and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. How often do we come into church and we have that type of reverence to the Word of God? How often do we, do we come and we subject ourselves to, so much to the teaching and the explaining of the Word of God that, that in our hearts, maybe not physically, we're on our faces on the ground, but in our hearts and our minds, we're sitting in our pews with our faces to the ground, not even worthy to be hearing the words of God. And, and I'm guilty of it, and I'm, I'd say we're all guilty of it, but oftentimes we come to church and we think, oh, I don't want to go to church this evening. I had a big meal. I had a good nap. I'm a little groggy. I don't feel like going. I had a hard weekend. I spent all day Saturday at the lake. I don't feel like waking up in the morning and sitting in a pew and putting on a suit or a nice dress and listening to the Word of God. Or after church, we take our Bible and we throw it in the car and it sits in the back seat until the next Sunday and then we pick it back up. And I'm only saying this because I've been guilty of it myself. And so oftentimes that happens. And I, I, and I wonder if, if we were to switch our living conditions with what it was like in Nehemiah's day, what people would have done if they had access to the book like we do. Oftentimes, we have two or three, and they had one for the entire city. So whenever it was time to open the book and hear it explained, they were ready to come. They didn't have to sit in a cushioned seat. They were willing to stand the entire day. What's interesting to me is, and again, the only reason I say it is because I'm guilty of it as well, is we can go to sporting events and we can sit in a bleacher with no seat back on a plastic seat and you're the unlucky one that got the seat with the bolt that's coming up a little bit too much so you're sitting sideways. And you're sitting like this between people. You can't move. It's hot. But we can sit there for hours and hours and hours and watch our kids, watch our family, or watch our favorite sports teams play a game. And we never complain about it. Oftentimes, if it was a good game, we'll leave and say, man, that was a great game. But oftentimes, we come to church and we sit in a comfortable pew in, a, in an air-conditioned room. And oftentimes, we have plenty of space and we hear the word. And oftentimes, we leave and we find everything that we can complain about. 
Sometimes we come to church and we think nothing big is happening here. Nothing eternal is happening in this place. Nothing weighty is happening in this place. That's why our numbers on Sunday nights is a third of what it is on Sunday mornings and why it's a fourth of what it is Wednesdays as it is on Sunday mornings. Because nothing huge happens on Wednesday nights. Nothing heavenly, nothing eternal happens on Sunday evenings. Ladies and gentlemen, when the book is being opened, eternal things are happening. Spiritual things are happening. Heavenly things are happening, and the people of Nehemiah knew that and subjected themselves to it. Fifthly, it was their source of joy and refreshment. Verse 9 through 12 says, And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. When he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. As the people came to hear the word, they understood the word and they saw the sin in their lives. They saw the sin for what it was. They saw their uncleanliness and it caused them to weep. It caused them to be upset because they were so far off of what the book had for them. They were so far off of what the standards in God's word was for them. And they're being comforted here saying, don't mourn. You don't have to mourn. Yes, you don't, you don't hit the mark at all. Yes, when we come to a service and maybe some things that were said from the word, it stepped on our toes a little bit, but you don't have to be upset because you can change that. They knew that God punished disobedience and He could easily wipe them off the face of the earth if He wanted to. When you look at the Israelites and their disobedience and then they're coming back to God and their disobedience and they're coming back to God and they just go back and forth and back and forth and you sit there and you think, Israel, when, you, when are you going to get it together? God could have easily just been done with you by now. So often when I think that way, I look at my own life and I think to myself, the times that I've been disobedient and then came back to God, and then disobedient and came back to God. Disobedient came back to God, and, and God's probably thinking to me, Andrew, when are you going to stop this cycle? And they were upset, but they were able to celebrate because God didn't wipe them off the face of this earth. God spared them. They knew that they could turn that disobedience into obedience, and that was reason to celebrate. So they were refreshed by the word, and in verse 10 it says, um, Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them whom nothing is prepared. Now that they had had a brokenness of heart, they have seen their sins, and they have decided to turn from that, and they were now rejoicing and they were going to go celebrate because they were turning from their disobedience. They were then told, go take that to other people. Go take that to the others who have not prepared anything. Who haven't prepared to celebrate. Go take this news to them and take some food so you can celebrate together. And we should be just like that. We should, we should be able to come and hear the Word of God and to be broken in our own spirits and to leave this place as we've laid our sins at the feet of Jesus, as we've gotten past that, as we've decided that we're going to turn from our disobedience and go be obedient. And we should leave this place with a lighter heart, celebrating what God has done for us. And then we should go and take that and give it to people that have not prepared anything for themselves. It was their source of joy and refre refreshment. Number six, they had obedience to the word. Verse 13 says, And on the second day, 
were gathered together, the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. And that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of thick trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths for everyone upon the roof of his house and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the street of the water gate and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. And all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, unto the day that had not the children of Israel done so, and there was great gladness. Now, the reason that this was called the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Booths is, again, it was a time that they would look back on the time of wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And they would look and they would see how God provided them through that and He was forgiving of that time and, and they were able to come out of that. And it was a time that they could look back and remember that. And what they were supposed to do is they were supposed to go up into the mountain and get branches and trees and they were supposed to go to their homes and they weren't supposed to live in the comfort of their own homes. They were supposed to build these booths or huts and they would build them and they would live in, the, in those huts for a week as this feast was happening. And they would live in those huts to remind themselves of what they went through. And the Bible is very clear how long it had been since they hadn't done, done it. In verse 17 in the middle it says, For since the days of Joshua the son of Nun. If you look back to Joshua, the date of Joshua's time was around 1500 B.C. and the time Nehemiah was written was about 420 B.C. So if you do the math, it's been about a thousand years since they have done this. Every year that they are supposed to observe the Feast of Tabernacles or booths, they are supposed to do this. And it's been a thousand years since they've done it. And after hearing the word, and the Bible tells us in, in verse 13 that the second day as they opened the word, they realized that they hadn't been doing this. They realized that the Bible was very clear, the word of God was very clear that they need to be going and doing this. And they were immediately obedient to that. They didn't sit around and talk about it. They didn't sit around and ask Ezra, why haven't we done this for a thousand years? They didn't look back and say, well, David and Solomon lived during that time. They, they must have been doing something right, and they didn't observe this. They could have looked to man's opinions. They could have looked to tradition and said, well, we, we never do that, so it must not be that important. That's part of the Bible that we don't really follow. It, it can't be that important. If we haven't followed it for a thousand years, they could have questioned it, but they didn't. They went directly out, got the branches, and did exactly what they were supposed to do. And in the end of the verse, it said, they did it with gladness. This, this point is probably the hardest one to swallow out of all of them because so often, our culture today picks and chooses what they want to follow out of the Bible. It's called buffet Christianity. You walk down, you go through the Bible, and you say, I want a little bit of that, I want a little bit of that, I don't want any of that, and I want some of that. And that's how we handle our Christianity, and we, we think to ourselves, well, yes, the Bible is very clear, this is what it says, but we don't do that around here. We haven't done that for years. Men that are, that are much smarter than us, the great theologians, they didn't follow that rule either, so it must not be that important. But it didn't matter to the people in Nehemiah's day. They heard the word, they knew exactly what it meant, and they didn't question it. They were obedient to it. And then number seven, you see that the book is sufficient for every day and every situation in life. Verse 18, it says, Also day by day, from the first day unto the last day, he read in the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day was a solemn blessing according unto the manner. Those seven days were not just a time of remembering. It wasn't just a time of looking back. It was also a time of looking to the future. It was a time of looking to the future kingdom when God comes back and rebuilds His kingdom and all of 
His church is a happy and redeemed people together. And until that day comes, we have times of memorial, of looking back, and times of looking forward as we look into the book. The people here, as we see, they gathered as one man. They had one mind. They were unified to worship not the book, but the author of the book. And they honored the contents of the book because of the author. And they subjected themselves to the words in that book because of the author. It was their source of joy and refreshment. And because of that, they were obedient to it. And it was sufficient for every single day of their life and every situation they could have been through or gone through. And that's what we get in Nehemiah 8. And if we don't handle the Word of God like the people in Nehemiah's day handled it, if we don't have the amount of respect and reverence that it deserves, the generations to come are not going to have a reverence and a respect for the book. When troubling times come their way, when times of doubt come their way, when it's time for another great awakening, they might not be shouting, bring the book. So this week as we focus in on the Bible, I hope it's also a reminder to us as a church that this is our bedrock base. It's a letter of love from Jesus Christ to us, and it is very exciting to explore. Let's pray. Father, again, we come to you thankful for your word. We thank, we're thankful that you are the author that is trustworthy, that we can trust you for every aspect of life and everything that we need is in your book. And I pray that we wouldn't just treat it as another piece of literature. We'd treat it as, as it is, as it is a living word of God. And I pray that you would help us to respect it and to honor it as we should, not because of the book itself, but because of the author. Lord, I pray that you would be with Vacation Bible School this week, that we'd be able to revive our own hearts and help the children that come know that the Bible is the bedrock of their life. And Lord, I pray that you would just go with us throughout the rest of the evening, be with us as we have time of fellowship in your name. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 545 to close, Living for Jesus, 545. Let's stand again, please. <clears throat> Thank you for coming out this evening. I hope you all can stay with us for a time of food and fellowship uh, for our snack night. We'll go ahead and go right into that. I think everything is ready and laid out for us. So uh, again, we hope you all can stay. And if you can't, uh, take something for the road. We'd, uh, we'd love to have you stay, though. So uh, uh, if uh, Dick Day, I would ask uh, to bless the food and also close us in prayer. <clears throat> 